Part 1 Enlistment 67 to 65 years before the Battle of Yavin. Chapter 1 The Underworld 47 standard years before the harrowing reign of Emperor Palpatine, Bull Demnick was nothing more than an embryonic world in the Outer Rim's oral sector. Populated by reptilian sentients who expressed as little tolerance for outsiders as they did for one another. Decades later, the planet would have a part to play in galactic events, its own wink of historical notoriety. But in those formative years that presaged the Republic's ineluctable slide into decadence and turmoil, Baldemnik was of interest only to xenobiologists and cartographers. It might even have escaped the notice of Darth Plagueis, for whom remote worlds held a special allure, had his master, Tenebros, not discovered something special about the planet. Darth Bane would appreciate our efforts, the Sith Master was telling his apprentice as they stood by the side in the as they stood side by side in the crystalline cave that had drawn them across the stars. A bith Tenebros was as tall as Plagueis and nearly as cadaverously thin. To human eyes, his billowous complexion might have made him appear as haggard as the pallid Mun, but in fact, both beings were in robust health. Though they conversed in basic, each was fluent in the other's native language. Darth Bane's early years. Plagueis said through his transpir- transpirator mask, carrying on their ancestral business, as it were. Behind the faceplate of his own mask, Tenebros's puckered lips twitched in disapproval. The breathing device looked absurdly small on his outsized cleft head, and the convexity of the mask made the flat discs of his lidless eyes look like close-set holes in his pinched face. Bane seminal years, he corrected. Plagueis rithered to gentle the gentle rebuke. He had been apprenticed to Tenebris for as many years as the average human might live, and still Tenebris never failed to find fault when he could. What more appropriate way for us to close the circle than by mimicking the Scytherai's seminal efforts? Tenebris continued. We weave ourselves into the warp and weft of the tapestry he created. Plagueis kept his thoughts to himself. The aptly named Darth Bane, who had redefined the Sith by limiting their number and operating from concealment, had mined Cortosis as a youth on Apatros long before embracing the tenets of the dark side. In the thousand years since his death, Bane had become deified. The powers attributed to him, legendary. And indeed, what more appropriate place for his disciples to complete the circle, Plagueis told himself, than in confound obscurity, deep within an escarpment that walled an azure of expanse of Baldemic's northern sea. The two Sith were outfitted in, in environment suits that protected them from scorching heat and noxious atmosphere. The cave was cross-hatched by scores of enormous crystals that resembled glowing lances thrust every which way into a thick chest by a stage magician. A reminiscent seismic event had tipped the landmass, emptying the labyrinthine cave system of mineral-rich waters, but the magma chamber that had kept the waters shimmering for millions of years still heated the humid air to temperatures in excess of what even Tenebris and Plagueis could endure unaided. Close at hand sat a stubby treadroid tasked with monitoring the progress of a mining probe that was sampling a rich vein of cortosis ore at the bottom of a deep shaft. A fabled ore, some called it, owing to its scarcity, but even more for its intrinsic ability to diminish the effectiveness of the Jedi lightsaber. For that reason, the Jedi Order had gone to great lengths to resist mining, to restrict mining and refinement of the ore. If not the bane of the Order's existence, Cortosis was a kind of irritant, a challenge to the to their weapon's reputation, 
for fearsome invincibility. It was to Tenebris's credit that the Sith had learned of Baldinex's rich loads before the Jedi, who, by means of an agreement with the Republic Senate, had first claim to all the discoveries, as they had with Adegian crystals and Force-sensitive younglings of all species. But Tenebris and the generations of Sith Masters who had preceded him were privy to convert data gleaned by vast networks of informants the Senate and the Jedi knew nothing about, including mining survey teams and weapons manufacturers. Based on the data I am receiving, the Tetadroid intoned, 82% of the ore is capable of being purified into weapons-grade Cortosis shield. Plagueis looked at Tenebris, who returned a nod of satisfaction. The percentage is consistent with what I was told to expect. By whom, master? Of no consequence, Tenebris said. Strewn about the superheated tunnel were broken borer bits, expended gasifiers, and clogged filtration masks, all abandoned by an exploratory team that had sunk the shaft several standard months earlier. From the shaft's broad mouth issued the repeated reports of the probe droid's hydraulic jacks, Music to Tenebris's auditory organs, Plagueis was certain. Can you not share your plans for this discovery? In due time, Darth Plagueis. Tenebris turned away from him to address the tread droid. Instruct the probe to evaluate the properties of the secondary load. Plagueis studied the screen affixed to the droid's flathead. It displayed a map of the probe's movements and a graphic analysis of its penetrating scans, which reached clear to the upper limits of the magma chamber. The probe is always running an analysis, the Tredroid updated, with the reciprocating sounds of the probe's hydraulic jack cycling in the cave, ca crystal cave, Tenebris began to circle the shaft, only to come to a sudden halt when the drilling ceased. Why has it stopped? He asked before plague is good. The droid replies immediately. The M2 unit informs me that it has discovered a pocket of gas directly beneath the new borehole. The droid paused, then added, I am sorry to report, sirs, that the gas is a highly combustible vari variant of lethane. The M2 unit predicts that the heat generated by its hydraulic jacks will ignite an explosion of significant magnitude. Suspicion crept into Trenobus's voice. The original report made no mention of lethane. The droid pivoted to face him. I know nothing of that, sir, but the M2 unit is quite inconsistent. What's more, my own programming corroborates the fact that it is not unusual to find pockets of lethane in close proximity to Cortos's core. Query the probe about excavating around the lethane pocket. Plagueis said. The M2 unit recommends employing that very strategy, sir. Shall I order it to proceed? Plagueis looked at Trenobus, who nodded. Test the probe to proceed, Plagueis said. When the hammering recommended, he fixed his gaze on the display screen to monitor the probe's progress. Tell the probe to stop, he said after only a moment had elapsed. Why are you interfering? Trenobus said, storming forward. Plagueis gestured to the display. The map indicates a more massive concentration of lethane in the area where it's drilling. You're correct, sir, the droid said in what amounted to dismay. I will order the unit to halt all activity. And yet the ha hammering continued. Droid! Plagueis snapped. Did the probe acknowledge your order? No, sir. The M2 is not responding. Tenebris stiffened, narrowly avoiding slamming his head into one of the cave's massive crystals. Is it still within range? Yes, sir. Then run a communications diagnostic. I have, sir. And all systems are nominal. The unit's inability to respond. It fell briefly silent and began again. The unit's refusal to respond appears to be deliberate. Deactivate it, Tenebris said. At once. 
The hammering slowed and eventually ceased, but not for long. The M2 unit has been overridden by my command. Impossible, the number said. Clearly not, sir. In fact, it is highly probable that the unit is excavating, executing a deep-seated subroutine that escaped earlier notice. Plagueis glanced at Trinibus. Who procured the probe? This isn't the time for questions. The probe is about to breach the pocket. Hastening to the rim of the circular shaft, the two Sith removed their gloves and aimed their long fingers unpro long fingered unprotected hands into the inky darkness. Instantly tangles of blue electricity electrical energy discharged from their fingertips, raining into the borehole. Strobing and clawing for the bottom, the vigorous bolts coruscated into the lateral corridor to the probe had excavated. Crackling sounds spewed from the opening long after the Sith had harnessed their powers. Then the repetitive strikes of the jackhammer began once more. It's the ore, Tenebris said. There's too much resistance here. Plagueis knew what needed to be done. I'll go down, he said, and was on the verge of leaping into the shaft when Trinibus restrained him. This can wait. We're returning to the grotto. Plagueis hesitated, then nodded. As you say, master. Tenebris swung to the droid. Continue your attempts to deactivate the unit. I will, sir. To do that, however, I will need to remain here. What of it? Tenebris asked, said, cocking his head to one side. Should I fail in my efforts, the ensuing explosion will surely result in my destruction. Plagueis understood. You've been useful, droid. Thank you, sir. Tenebris scrawled. You waste your breath. Nearly knocked over by the swiftness of Tenebris' departure, Plagueis had to call deeply on the force merely to keep up. Retracting the inclined path they had taken from the grotto in which their starship waited, they fairly flew up the crystal-studded tunnel they had picked their way through earlier. Plagueis grasped that a powerful explosion was perhaps imminent, but was mystified by his master's almost mad dash for the surface. In the past, Tenebris had rarely evinced signs of discomfort, let alone fear. So what danger had he sensed that propelled him with such abandon? And when, in the past, had they fled danger of any sort? Safeguarded by the powers of the dark side, the Sith could hardly fear death when they were allied to it. Plagueis stretched out with his with its feelings in an attempt to identify the source of Tenebris' dread, but the force was silent. Ten meters ahead of him, the Bith had ducked under a scabrous outcropping. Haste, however, brought him upright too quickly, and his left shoulder glanced off the rough rock, leaving a portion of his suit shredded. Master, allow me to lean, Plagueis said when he reached Tenebris. He was only slightly more agile than the Bith, but he had better night vision and a keener sense of direction, over and above what the Force imparted. His pride wounded more than his shoulder. Tenebris weave, waved off the offer. Be mindful of your place. Regaining his balance and composure, he streaked off. But at a fork in the tunnel, he took the wrong turn. This way, master. Plagueis called from the other corridor, but he stopped to surrender the lead. Closer to the surface, the tunnels opened into caverns the size of cathedrals, smooth and hollowed by rainwater that still surged in certain seasons of Baldemic's long year. In pools of standing water darted various species of blind fish. Overhead, hawkbats took panicked flight from their roosting pl places in the stipled ceiling. Natural light in the far distance prompted the two Sith to race for the grotto, but even so, they were a moment late. The gas explosion caught up with them just as they were entering the light-filled cavity on the top of the encarpment. From deep in the tunnel resounded a squealing electronic wail, and at the same time, almost as if the cave system were gasping for breath, a searing wind tore down 
from a perforation in the grotto's arched ceiling through which the ship had entered. A muffled but ground-heaving detonation followed. Then, a roiling fireball that was the labyrinth's scorching exhalation. Whirling to the tunnel they had just exited and managing somehow to remain on his feet, Tenebus conjured a force shield with his waving arms and met the fireball and contained it. Thousands of flaming hawk bats spiraling within the tum tumult like wind-blown embers. A few meters away, Plagueis hurled face first to the ground by the intensity of the vaporizing blast, lifted his head in time to see the underside of the doomed ceiling begin to shed enormous slabs of rock. Directly below the plummeting slabs sat their starship. Master, he said, scrambling to his feet with his arms lifted in an attempt to hold the rocks in midair. His own arms still raised in a force summoning position, Tenebris swung around to bolster Plagueis' intent. Behind him, the fireball's final flame surged from the mouth of the tunnel to lick his back and drive him deeper into the grotto. The cave continued to spasm underfoot, sending shockwaves through the crazed ceiling. Cracks spread like a web from the oculus, triggering, triggering collapses throughout the grotto. Plagueis heard a rending sound overhead and watched a fissure zigzag its way across the ceiling, slowing layer after layer of stone as it followed the grotto's curved wall. Now, though it was Tenebris who was positioned beneath the fall, and in that instant, Plagueis perceived the danger Tenebris had foreseen earlier. His death. His death at Plagueis' hands. While Tenebris was preoccupied holding aloft the slabs that threatened to crush the ship, Plagueis quickly reoriented himself, aiming his raised hands at the plummeted slabs above his master and with the downward motion of both arms brought them down so quickly and with so much momentum that Tenebris was buried almost before he understood what had hit him. Stone dust eddying around him, Plagueis stood rooting in place as slabs entered the starship as well. But he gave it no thought. His success in bringing the ceiling down on Tenebris was proof enough that the Bith had grown sluggish and expendable. Otherwise, he would have divined the true source of the danger he had sensed, and Plagueis would be the one pressed to the floor of the grotto, head cracked open like an egg and chest cavity pierced by the pointed end of a fallen stalactite. His race to Tenebris' side was informed as much by excitement as charade. Master, he said, genuflecting and removing his and Tenebris' respirators. His hands pawed at the stones, removing some of the crushing weight, but Tenebris' single lung was pierced, and blood gurgled in his throat. Ragged tears in the sleeves of the Enviro suit revealed esoteric body markings and tattoos. Stop, apprentice, Tenebris strained to say. You're going to need all your strength. I can help. There's time. I'm dying, Darth Plagueis. There's time only for that. <laughs> Plagueis held the myth's pain pained gaze. I did all that I could, Master. Tenebris interrupted him once more. To be strong in the Force is one thing. But to believe oneself to be all-powerful is to invite catastrophe. Remember that even in the ethereal realm we inhabit, the unforeseen can occur. A stuttering cough silenced him for a moment. Better this way, perhaps, than to perish at your hand. As Darth Bane would have wished, Plagueis thought. Who supplied the mining probe, master? Subtext, Tenebris said in a weak voice. Subtext mining. Plagueis nodded. I will avenge you. Tenebris canted his huge head ever so slightly. Will you? Of course. If the Bith was convinced, he kept it to himself and said instead, you are fated to bring the Sith Imperative to fruition, Plagueis. It falls to you to bring the Jedi Order to its knees and to save the rest of the galaxy's sentience from themselves. 
At long last, Plagueis told himself, the mantle has conferred. But I need to warn you, Tenebris started to say and fell abruptly silent. Plagueis could sense the Bith's highly evolved mind, replaying current events, calculating odds, reaching conclusion. Warn me about what, master? Tenebris' black eyes shone with yellow light. And his free hand clutched at the ring collar, Plagueis' and viral suit. You! Plagueis pried the Bith's thin hand from the fabric and grinned faintly. Yes, master. Your death comes at my bidding. You said yourself that permutation with purpose is the only way to victory. And so it is. Go to your grave, knowing that you are last of the old order, the vaunted rule of two, and that the new order begins now and will for a thousand years remain in my control. <laughs> Tenebris coughed spittle and blood. Then for the last time, I call you apprentice, and I applaud your skillful use of surprise and misdirection. Perhaps I was wrong to think you had no stomach for it. <laughs> the dark side guided me, Tenebris. You sensed it, but your lack of faith in me clouded your thoughts. The Biths had bobbled in agreement. Even before we came to Baldemnik, and yet we came because we were fated to. Tenebris paused. Then spoke with renewed urgency. But wait! The ship! Crashed as you are. Tenebris' anger stabbed at Plagueis. You forced everything to undo me. The entire future of the Sith. My instincts about you prove correct after all. Plagueis leaned away from him. Nonchalant, but in fact filled with an icy fury. I'll find a way home, Tenebris, as will you. And with a chopping motion of his left hand, he broke the Bith's neck. Tenebris was paralyzed and unconscious, but not yet dead. Plagueis had no interest in saving him, even if it were possible. But he was interested in observing the behavior of the Bith's midichlorians as life ebbed. The Jedi thought of the cellular organelles as symbionts, but to Plagueis, midichlorians were interlopers, running in interference for the Force, and standing in the way of a being's ability to contact the Force directly. Through years of experimentation and directed meditation, Plagueis had honed an ability to perceive the actions of midichlorians, though not yet the ability to manipulate them. Manipulate them, say, to prolong Tenebris' life. Looking at the Bith through the Force, he perceived that the Midichlorians were already beginning to die out, as were the neurons that made up Tenebris' lofty brain and the muscle cells that powered his once able heart. A common misconception held that Midichlorians were Force-carrying particles, when in fact they functioned more as translators interlocutors of the will of the force. Plagueis considered his long-standing fascination with the organelles to be as natural as had been Tenebris' fixation on shaping the future. Where Bith intelligence was grounding in, in mathematics and computation, Mun intelligence was driven by a will to profit. As a Mun, Plagueis viewed his allegiance to the Force as an investment that could, with proper effort, be maximized to yield great returns. True, too, to Mun's psychology and tradition, he had, through the decades, hoarded his success and never once taken Tenebrous into his confidence. The Bith's moribund midichlorians were wink winking out like light slow slowly deprived of a power source, and yet Plagueis could still perceive Tenebris in the Force. One day he would succeed in imposing his will on the Midichlorians to keep them aggregate. But such speculations were for another time. Just now, Tenebris and all he had been in life were beyond Plagueis' reach. He wondered if the Jedi were 
subsumed in similar fashion. Even in life, did midichlorians behave in a Jedi as they did in a devotee of the dark side? Were the organelles invigorated by different impulses, prompted into action by different desires? He had encountered many Jedi during his long life, but he had never made an attempt to study one in the same way he appraised Tenebris now, out of concern for revealing the power of his allegiance with the dark side. That, too, might have to change. Tenebris died while Plagueis observed. In Bane's age, a Sith might have had to guard against an attempt at essence transfer by the deceased, a leap into the consciousness of the Sith who survived. But those times were long past, and of no relevance, not since the teachings had been sabotaged, the technique lost. The last Sith possessed of the knowledge had been inexplicably drawn to the light side and killed taking the secret process with him.